नमस्कार अ वॉर्म वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज आर एस राघु एंड विद मी इज रेणुका ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी लेज द फाउंडेशन स्टोन ऑफ ट्रांसपोर्ट एयरक्राफ्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग प्रोजेक्ट एट वडोदरा Russia suspends its participation in a UN brokered grain deal with Ukraine. Poland chooses US firm Westinghouse to build its first nuclear power plant to become energy independent. President of Lebanon Michel Aoun vacates the presidential palace leaving a void at the top of a failing state. London Mayor Sadiq Khan calls for immediate freeze on private sector rents to reduce the number of people sleeping in open streets. Indian Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas Hardeep Singh Puri will visit UAE to attend Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibit and Conference 2022. And in T20 World Cup cricket, South Africa beat India by 5 wickets at Perth. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Sunday said India is moving towards becoming a global manufacturing hub with growing cost effective manufacturing capabilities global standard comparative environment and ease of doing business after laying the foundation stone of C295 MW transport aircraft manufacturing project at Vadodara in Gujarat Mr Modi said this project will be a milestone in achieving goals of atmanirbhar bharat aaj bharat ko दुनिया का बड़ा मैन्युफैक्चरिंग हब बनाने की दिशा में हम बहुत बड़ा कदम उठा रहे हैं भारत आज अपना फाइटर प्लेन बना रहा है भारत आज अपना टैंक बना रहा है अपनी सबमरीन बना रहा है और सिर्फ नहीं भारत में बनी दवाइयां और वैक्सीन भी आज दुनिया में लाखों लोगों का जीवन बचा रही है भारत में बने इलेक्ट्रॉनिक गैजेट भारत में बने मोबाइल फोन भारत में बनी कारें आज कितने ही देशों में छाई हुई है मेक इन इंडिया मेक फॉर द ग्लोब इस मंत्र पर आगे बढ़ता रहा भारत आज अपने सामर्थ्य को और बढ़ा रहा है द प्राइम मिनिस्टर सेड विद दिस मेक इन इंडिया प्रोजेक्ट कंट्री विल एक्वायर केपेबिलिटीज टू मेक ट्रांसपोर्ट एयरक्राफ्ट speaking on the occasion defense minister rajnath singh called the moment a milestone in the journey of self reliance of the indian defense sector russia has suspended its participation in a un brokered grain deal with ukraine this was regarded as the key to addressing global food shortage in a tweet dmitry polyansky deputy russian envoy to the uncnn stated that after the attempt of a ukrainian drone attack against russian military ships ensuring safe functioning of grain deal which according to russia's mod's data was carried out with uk support russia suspends participation in the deal he also added that antonio guterres secretary general united nations would be officially notified shortly The grain deal signed between Russia and Ukraine with the United Nations and Turkey had paved way for export of 22 million Ukrainian grains which were stuck in three black sea ports. The deal was set to expire next month. Meanwhile, over 100 prisoners of war were released in a swap between Ukraine and Russia on Saturday. Poland has chosen US firm Westinghouse to build the European country's first nuclear power plant. The move comes in as a part of the country's effort to burn less coal and gain greater energy independence. Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki stated that Poland would use the reliable safe technology of the Westinghouse Electric Company for the plant in Pomerania province near the Baltic Sea coast. The country plans to spend 40 billion dollars for the building of the two nuclear power plants with three reactors each. The last one set to be launched in 2043. This deal is for the first three reactors of the Pomerania plant. As per Poland's government officials, it should start producing electricity in 2033. Early 1980s saw the construction of a Soviet technology nuclear plant which was scrapped following protests by residents and environmentalists the 1986 disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine and budget shortages 
Jennifer Granholm, U.S. Energy Secretary, stated that the project would create or sustain more than one lakh jobs for American workers. Before signing up this deal, Poland had been considering offers from France and South Korea. Jacek Sasin, Poland State Assets Minister, suggested that there could be still a role for South Korea in the project and more talks are scheduled in Seoul in the coming week. As a part of his North Africa and Asia visit, U.S. President Joe Biden would be attending the UN Climate Change Conference COP27 to be held in Egypt on 11th of November. He would also be attending other November summits in Cambodia and Indonesia. As per a White House statement, Biden will attend COP27 in Shamil Sheikh, Egypt, and thereafter he will attend U.S. ASEAN and East Asia Summit in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, on November 12th and 13th, and then travel to Bali, Indonesia, to attend the G20 Summit from November 13th to 16th. The U.S. President's visit will be followed by Vice President Kamala Harris' visit to Bangkok, Thailand, to attend the November 18th and 19th Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leaders' Meeting. Later, she would travel to Manila, the Philippines, to meet with government leaders and civil society representatives. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on United Nations Security Council's Counter-Terrorism Committee. In conversation are Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat and Manas Pratim Bhuyan, journalist. Ambassador Sajin Har, the final session of the two-day UN Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee's meeting in India is underway. The meeting has been focusing primarily on dealing with the challenges arising out of possible use of emerging and new technologies by various terrorist groups as well as non-state actors. How do you see India hosting the key conference of the UN Security Council? At a time, India has been facing cross-border terrorism, as well as the time India has been ramping up its diplomatic efforts to mobilize global supports for united efforts to deal with this scourge of terrorism. India has been uh, dealing with the scourge of terrorism for the last three decades or a little more than that. And India has always been uh, bringing this to the attention, to the notice of the global community that we really need to get together. The whole international community needs to come together and act against this menace in a united way. But you would recall and uh, the listeners would recall that uh, till the 9-11 attacks, the Western powers and all the other countries, they used to consider these attacks on India, the cross-border terrorism on India that was taking place. They would look upon this as some law and order problem, some criminal activities, and they would never really give any significant attention or focus on that particular issue. All of that changed with the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center towers in New York and on the Pentagon. And uh, we've seen for the last 20 years plus that the world is focusing on this particular issue. You would recall that after these terrorist attacks, we had the setting up of the 1267 committee under the UN Security Council, where there was, under the rubric of this committee, there would be designation of international terrorists, international terrorist organizations, and since then, there has been a great focus on how this menace can be effectively dealt with. And we have seen also that it works in coordination with the Financial Action Task Force. So money laundering and terror financing, these are the two biggest problems, most acute problems that the world is facing. India has been particularly focusing on this issue of terrorism for the last many years, but I would say particularly since 2014, since the time that Prime Minister Modi took up the reins of power in India. I don't think there has been any single regional forum or international meeting where either the Prime Minister or the External Affairs Minister or the Home Minister have not focused on the issue of terrorism. So it is befitting that when India is chairing the Counterterrorism Committee in the UN Security Council during its two-year tenure as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, that this meeting is taking place in India. In fact, this is the first meeting of the UN Security Council that is taking place in India after the 9-11 attacks. And your listeners are aware that yesterday the meeting took place in 
Mumbai that was very symbolic, that was very poignant, when at the same venue where the 26-11 attacks had taken place in 2008, we had 10 terrorists from Pakistan who had come and they had killed 166 people, 140 Indians and 26 others from 23 countries. And uh, speaking about this, what uh, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jayashankar said yesterday is that the 26-11 attack was not only an attack against Mumbai, but it was an attack against the global community because the terrorists specifically identified, chose and selected the citizens of different countries that they had pre-marked and those people were killed. So it is to bring the world on a single platform to deal with the issue of terrorism and also to focus on the new and emergent technologies which are becoming so very common and which are being used by the terrorists to launch even more violent and more diabolic attacks on innocent people around the world. This is a very key point, Ambassador Sajjan, how you have mentioned. Actually, in his remarks, our Foreign Minister Jaishankar has talked about technological innovations and how these innovations have transformed people's lives. At the same time, he also expressed concern about using of these technologies like cryptocurrency, like virtual platforms, like social media platforms by terror groups and non-state actors to spread their ideology and spread their terror networks. The conference primarily is focusing on dealing with these challenges, on how to deal with the challenge of terror networks using these new emerging technologies to get financing, to get support base. Mr. Jaishankar also talked about the use of cryptocurrency. So how do you see it? I mean, his point was that there's a lack of regulatory framework at this point to deal with the challenge of the vulnerabilities of the new technologies and this is what he wants the world to deliberate on to find ways so that in fact the terror groups or the hate mongerers cannot use new technologies to spread their agenda. Yeah, you're absolutely right Manish. This is what Dr. Jaishankar spoke about. Number one, that these technologies are becoming very easily available. They are becoming very cheap to use. So the terrorist groups and organizations and even single terrorists, they can use these technologies to devastating effect. During this meeting, I think there were three particular technologies that were chosen that were identified for special attention. One was in terms of internet has become such an ubiquitous platform. It is available to each and every one of the individuals. And it is good because internet we have seen is a force for good. It has helped to communicate and it has helped governments also to deliver services in such a good way. But then it is also misused also in terms of social media platforms. So this has been used to launch terror attacks against states, against uh, peaceful organizations, peaceful institutions innocent men, women and children. So how is it that there can be, whether it is the social media or other platforms, how can they be regulated so that it is not an impediment on the free expression of the people and all the positive aspects of the internet can be harnessed. But when there is hate speech on social media, then there should be some accountability and these companies, they should be held responsible for this. The second is in terms of digitization, because there also we have seen how in India it has revolutionized the extension of how the government extends benefits and services to the common people to the farthest reaches. There is no middle person, the direct benefit transfer schemes, how they can help common people, poor people in village and remote areas. But then this digitalization is also used for money laundering, for terror financing, and how is it that this can be regulated? And in this context, there is also the issue of the cryptocurrency that you mentioned that the External Affairs Minister had referred to. And then, of course, there's the issue of drones. And we have seen that as far as the drone technology is concerned, it has been used in very positive effect in terms of taking medicines to faraway places, in terms of spraying insecticides and other chemicals as far as agriculture is concerned. So drones have very beneficial effects, but it is also used to transport explosives, guns, ammunition, and also drugs. The drones have suddenly come onto the global scene, 
and how is it that the world can work together so that their misuse or abuse that can also be tackled that can be dealt with so i think what dr jayshankar spoke yesterday in mumbai and what he also referred to today in his opening statement at the beginning of this two day meeting i think that really set the tone for the subsequent discussions and what he mentioned is that he referred to two of the terrorist attacks the 2611 terrorist attacks and also the brussels airport terror attack at the meeting yesterday there was also the audio clip of sajid meer who was one of the main organizers who was the main perpetrators of this attack how he was sitting in pakistan and he was directing the terrorist attack in india for the 2611 and dr jayshankar lamented and expressed unhappiness dismay that even after so many years these terrorists have not been brought to book and he said that double standards should not be resorted to by countries how do you see dr joy thinker's comments that the un has been effective to put countries on notice that turn terrorism into a state funded enterprise i think the message that the israel says minister want to give to all the participants you know and i think it's a matter of satisfaction and gratification that all the 15 members of the UN Security Council were represented the five permanent members as well as the 10 non permanent members and also the five incoming members who will be replacing from 1st of January who will be replacing five members who are going out all those countries were also represented so all 20 countries were both in Mumbai and in Delhi and what Dr Jayshankar said is that if the scourge of terrorism has to be dealt with the whole world has to act in a united manner and there should not be any political considerations when speaking about the designation of these terrorists we have seen that over the last few months china has put a technical hold on five of these terrorists who have come from pakistan whether it is sajid meer who was involved in the 2611 attack or it is the son of hafiz said or it is some of the other terrorists about five of them they should have been designated by the un security council but china has put a technical hold and without any reason being ascribed to it it is a very opaque process and dr jayshankar said strongly supported that there should be greater transparency and you would recall also manish that when in 2009 we had asked for the designation of masood azhar as global terrorist under the 1267 committee at that time also china had put a technical hold this technical hold lasted for about 10 years and on four occasions when this issue was taken up in the 1267 committee then it was still not china continued to exercise its veto and put a technical hold but when the further pressure was mounted on china in 2019 by both the united states as well as the united kingdom then only china relented so i think this is as dr jayshankar put it this reflects very poorly on the credibility of the institution if such double standards for political consideration the designations are not agreed upon and if we have to deal with it then the whole world needs to work together but i think as far as the case of india is concerned while working very assiduously on the platform of the security council india is also quite convinced that it has to strengthen itself and that is what we did when we had the pulwama attack we had the balakot strikes and in 2019 february and when we had the uri attack then we had the surgical strikes in september 2016 so i think along with strengthening and responding effectively and robustly to any terror attacks that take place against us we also work with the global community and the global community stands with india this is what we have seen india's position brought has attracted a lot of support and traction as far as the other countries are concerned thank you very much ambassador sajjan har for a detailed perspective about india's consistent efforts to you know build global consensus to deal with terrorism and the ongoing meeting in new delhi thank you so much thank you this is all india radio giving you the world news for quick news updates round the clock follow us on twitter at aiar news alerts 
Michel Aoun, President of Lebanon, on Sunday vacated the presidential palace, leaving a void at the top of a failing state. The 89-year-old Christian leader had presided over Lebanon during its financial meltdown and the Beirut port blast. The parliament has been unable to agree on a successor in the role, while the state is being currently governed by a caretaker cabinet, as the premier-designate has been trying for six months to form a government. The Babda Palace was surrounded by supporters to bid farewell to Aoun, who wore the orange associated with his Free Patriotic Movement Party. Aoun had secured presidency in 2016, endorsed by Hezbollah and rival Maronite Christian politician Samir Gaege. This deal had brought then-leading Sunni politician Saad al-Hariri back as Prime Minister. In his final week in the palace, Aoun signed onto a U.S. mediated deal delineating Lebanon's southern maritime border with Israel. London recently saw a surge in new warnings over a significant increase in rough sleeping amid concerns of higher costs of living forcing more people onto the streets. Rough sleeping refers to people sleeping on the streets without a shelter. An increase of 21% has been recorded by the official data in the number of people sleeping rough in the capital of UK. London Mayor Sadiq Khan stated that without government intervention, the progress made in sheltering people since the COVID-19 pandemic would be reversed. He called for an immediate freeze on private sector rents, the lifting of the benefit cap and the unfreezing of housing benefits and more resources for local councils to aid the ones sleeping on the streets. The mayor said, our outreach workers, charity teams, healthcare professionals and council staff are not only vital partners in this work, but unsung heroes as well. He added, despite this progress, extraordinary financial pressures are putting the poorest Londoners at growing risk of homelessness with the number of people sleeping rough already up by a fifth year on year. Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas and Housing and Urban Affairs, Hardeep Singh Puri, will visit UAE on Monday to attend the opening ceremony of the Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibition and Conference ADIPEC 2022. According to official statement during the visit, the minister will deliver his special remarks at the inaugural ceremony of ADIPEC 2022. The minister is also scheduled to have bilateral discussions with his counterpart from UAE, H.E. Suhail Mohammad Faraz al Mazrui. Minister of Energy and Infrastructure and H.E. Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al-Jabir, Minister of Industry and Advanced Technology, MD and Group CEO, ADNOC, to strengthen energy cooperation within the overall framework of India-UAE strategic partnership. Mr. Puri also has meetings with his counterparts from various countries and heads of international energy organizations and CEOs of global oil and gas companies. During the event, the Minister will inaugurate the India Pavilion set up jointly by Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry, FIPI, and Confederation of Indian Industry, CII. Hosted by ADNOC, ADIPEC is one of the world's leading events of the indu- energy industry and aims to provide insights on the latest trends affecting an evolving global energy system including the global economy, energy supply as well as next generation of energy solutions. South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol on Sunday announced national mourning and ordered the lowing, lowering of flags over a deadly Seoul stampede during Halloween celebrations. South Korean media JTBC reports that at least 153 people were killed, including 19 foreigners, and another 103 were injured. A day after the stampede, Yoon, in a live address to the nation, said that it was truly horrific and that this tragedy should have never happened. He added that the government will designate the period from on Sunday until the accident is brought under control as a period of national mourning. It would also place top priority in administrative affairs and recovery and follow-up measures. He said that the most important thing is to determine the cause of the accident and prevent similar accidents in the future. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has expressed deep anguish at the tragic loss of lives at the stampede incident in Seoul. In his letter to President of South Korea, Yoon Suk Yeol, Mr. Modi also conveyed his heartfelt condolences to the friends and families who lost their loved ones. The packed Halloween festivities in South Korea's capital Seoul took place after COVID restrictions were removed. 
The festivities marked the participation of more than a lakh visitors and the number of casualties is only expected to rise. At least 100 people were killed and 300 injured in two car bombs that exploded outside the education ministry in Somalia's capital Mogadishu on Saturday. Police said most of the victims were civilians. Some of the wounded are in critical condition. The blasts occurred in the Zob district. Authorities said the Al-Shabaab group carried out the attack targeting the education ministry, an intersection and a school. The attack occurred on a day when the President, Prime Minister and other senior officials were meeting to discuss combating violent extremism, especially by Al-Shabaab group that often targets the capital. The first explosion hit the ministry, then the second blast occurred as ambulances arrived and people gathered to help the victims. The European Union has said that in order to continue availing the GSP Plus facility, Pakistan is required to ensure the implementation of 27 UN conventions relating to human rights, labor rights and climate change. Pakistan has been enjoying this facility since 2014 and benefited greatly from zero import duty on 66% of the tariff lines. The EU's generalized scheme of preferences plus gives developing countries a special incentive to pursue sustainable development and good governance. In ICC T20 Men's World Cup, India suffered a five-wicket defeat to South Africa in their Group 2 Super 12 match at Optus Stadium in Perth on Sunday evening. Batting first, India scored 133 runs for nine in stipulated 20 overs with the help of Surya Kumar Yadav's 68 of 40 balls. For the Proteas, Lungi Ingridi scalped four wickets while Wayne Parnell picked up three wickets. In reply, South Africa overhauled the target for the loss of five wickets in 19.4 overs, riding on David Miller's unbeaten 59 runs and Aidan Markram's 52 runs. For India, Arshdeep Singh took two wickets. During the match, star Indian batter Virat Kohli completed 1,000 runs at ICC T20 World Cup events, becoming only the second player to do so after Mahila Jaivardhana. Former Sri Lanka skipper Mahila Jaivardhana holds the record with 1,016 runs to his name. In another match on Sunday, Pakistan registered their first victory of the T20 World Cup 2022 after beating the Netherlands by six wickets at Perth. Batting first, Netherlands set a target of 92 runs, which Pakistan easily overhauled, losing four wickets in 13.5 overs. With this win, Pakistan has registered their two points and is in the fifth position in the points table. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Financial Times in a lead item says Brazilians vote after long and bitter presidential battle. The Guardian writes that car bombings kill at least 100 in Mogadishu, says Somali President. The Wall Street Journal reports that in Israel's election, Arab voter turnout could play a key role. The Washington Post quoting a report says Russia pause of grain drill after Ukraine strikes warship in Crimea. The Globe and Mail reports man attacks a UK migrant processing center kills himself, witness says. The New York Times says with Western weapons, Ukraine is turning the tables in an artillery war. Japan Times informs that man faces charge of attempted murder after attack on Nancy Pelosi's spouse. South China Morning Post writes that Elon Musk lays groundwork for layoffs at Twitter, asking managers to draw up lists. Reports. A quick look at the headlines once again. Prime Minister Narendra Modi lays the foundation stone of transport aircraft manufacturing project at Vadodara. Russia suspends its participation in a UN brokered grain deal with Ukraine. Poland chooses US firm Westinghouse to build its first nuclear power plant to become energy independent. President of Lebanon Michel Aoun vacates the presidential palace, leaving a void at the top of a failing state. London Mayor Sade Khan calls for immediate freeze on private sector rents to reduce the number of people sleeping in open streets. Indian Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas Hardeep Singh Puri will visit UAE to attend Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibits and Conference 2022. And in T20 World Cup, South Africa beat India by five wickets at birth. And now, before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan, by artists from Zambia.
we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World Music.